20 years later. Yep, it's been 20 years since the attacks of September 11, 2001. That means about a third of my life is post 9-11. doesn't seem anything like that long, but it really is. I thought what I might do on this anniversary is talk a little bit about the path that went from that awful Tuesday morning to get me here in this chair today. Maybe it'll spur some reflections of your own on this uh, particular anniversary. There are two things I remember about the day, the specific day. Uh, I live in California, and uh, I got a call that morning at around 8, I want to say, somewhere in that neighborhood, from a friend of mine, good friend of mine. And uh, he woke me up, and he said, turn on the TV. And I said, what channel? And he said, doesn't matter. That never left my head. The other thing about that morning on the TV that I remember was, as I came into the broadcast live, as I turned on the TV and started watching, I saw a helicopter circling a cloud of dust, and I saw uh, one of the World Trade Center towers. I had just missed the collapse of the first tower when I came into the story live. And I recall with crystal clarity, thinking to myself, isn't that strange? Funny how your memory plays tricks with you, because I was sure there were two, two towers there, but obviously I'm wrong. I couldn't process the fact, since I didn't see it fall, I couldn't process the fact that a building that size was simply gone. It, just, it was just cognitive dissonance. I couldn't put the two things together. I assumed I must have been wrong about that. And then they started showing the replays, and then they started showing the second tower come down, and then all of the footage came in live and uncensored with all the swearing and all of the, all of the brutality of it and all of the immediacy of it. And there was none of the censorship that followed in the months and years to pass. So I saw people jumping to their deaths, holding hands off the top of a building. I saw all of that. And after it appeared to be over after we heard about the Pentagon and after we heard about uh, United Flight 93 and all the rest of it. By this time, it was probably 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 1 o'clock, somewhere around there, Pacific time. And when it appeared that it was over for the day, and that's what it felt like was over for the day, I didn't know what to do, so I went to work. I just didn't have any idea what to do. Went to work, went to the studio. No, the studios are closed. Go back home. Okay. And on the way home, as I was thinking about this, if you were living through it at the time, and you had been so struck by it, just so knocked out, just gobsmacked by it, I remember thinking very clearly that maybe every other car on the freeway is filled with Muslim terrorists. And, and the, the second major thing I remember about the actual day was this burning desire, an irresistible burning desire. And on the way home, I stopped at a drugstore, and happily enough, there were a number of small cloth American flags about that big, a little bigger than the ones they put on sticks, I mean, about that size. I had to find an American flag. I had to. And I did. I found it early. And I immediately duct taped it on the top of my radio antenna because it was an imperative to me somehow that I show these bastards. Are you looking for targets? Here's a target right here. I mean, that was the number one thing on my mind was saying, was basically saying, okay. I see. I see what's going on now. You want, a, you want a target? You want to pick a fight? Here's somebody you can pick a fight with. I had to have that flag on my car. So I did. And I kept it on my car for as long as I had that car. In the days that followed, I, work, uh, I was working as an editor in a Hollywood studio. And there was some talk about how these attacks would continue. We certainly didn't think that was the end of them. In fact, if, if you told me that was the end of a major terrorist attack in America major attack, not, not a couple people shooting things up, not, that's not tragic enough, then I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, I was absolutely sure that this was just the beginning of a, of a long series of attacks. And in the days following 9-11, the two things that are most clear in my memory were going to the studio where I worked uh, on a movie lot and being in a line of cars waiting to get into the parking lot while security guards had mirrors on poles, and they were looking underneath all of our cars for bombs. Now, that may seem kind of paranoid to you, but uh, unlike some, some reports somewhere, I think on The Onion, that the Des Moines Public I, uh, Library was preparing for a terrorist attack, a movie studio had a reasonable chance because we were part of the pop culture that they hated so much. And that went on for months. And the second thing I remember in the days immediately after 9-11 was I had a window that was facing to the south, and I would often just glance out and watch the long, endless line of airplanes landing at LAX, 20, you can see 20 of them on a, on a good day. 
Nothing. There's nothing in the sky, nothing moving at all. Nothing. That was a bit of a shock. Uh, the show I was working on did a remote segment in Vegas, and I flew to Vegas probably within two or three days of air travel restarting. And I remember flying out of Los Angeles, looking down at all those buildings and thinking to myself, all right, you sons of bitches, we got more buildings. We got more buildings. Come on. Come on. And the same thought I had when I was in Vegas, you know, you, you, bring it. You know, just bring it. It's not a question of taunting somebody or poking a dog with a stick. It's a question of, okay, now you've done this. So now we know where we stand. But nothing happened there either. And in the years after 9-11, I remember thinking, I could not watch a Super Bowl. I could not watch a Thanksgiving Day parade. I could not especially watch the New Year celebration in Times Square for years, years, probably a full decade without some part of me thinking it, there's going to be a there's going to be a bomb going to go off something's going to happen and then it didn't so that's kind of the immediate emotional aftershock and then something started to change for me the events of September 11 2001 uh, changed a lot of people got a lot of people suddenly awake to the fact that no this isn't the end of history and the peace dividend and all that stuff that was going on in the Clinton years just ended I recall saying to myself, this, there's a lot going on there that I don't know about and that I need to know about. So unlike many people, I didn't start writing after 9-11, but I did start reading after 9-11. I read everything I could find, I read everything I could find about Islam, about Islamic culture, about their history, about, about what, what this arm of Islam believed, about the difference between Sunnis and Shias, about all of the terms I could know and all the rest of it, just learning what I could learn about this as quickly as I could. Now, my dad had died in uh, July of 2002 and had been cremated, but uh, there was a delay. They held on to his ashes because he was interred in Arlington National Cemetery in October of 2002. And there was a huge crowd for his initial uh, uh, eulogy, but out there several months after he died, it was just immediate family. And I got there early, and I didn't want to sit in a room with all these other grieving relatives, and I just went walking out in the fields, and I looked around at Arlington, and I noticed something about Arlington that I never forgot, and that is that all of the headstones are absolutely identical. You could just look down and say, here's a major general, and it's World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Gulf War, that kind of thing. And right next to him could be a private. Some of the headstone dates would say this guy had been in the Army for less than a year. Absolutely equal, absolutely next to each other. They took us out in a van, and it was as cold as I've ever been. It was a cold, cold October morning. And when the van stopped, we got out, and I saw, standing in the middle of the field, something like 20 or 30 young men, 18-year-old men, at attention in the honor guard, and another 30 or more so in the army band, and there was a case on, and there was a flag over it, and we started marching to... The, the place, the wall where, where my dad was in turn. And I remember most clearly the commands that were being spoken by, by the, the, the professionals that were running this service and how, and how everything was so quiet, it was so quiet. Just the commands were just, uh, and, and then nothing but just the click of, of drumsticks on the, on the rim of the drum, like that. And I remember thinking, my God, this, this man is speaking so quietly, only the dead can hear him. And it was an overcast day, and I know this is going to sound like I'm making it up, but I'm not, because this is what actually happened. We turned a corner, and just as we turned this corner, the army band went from this dirge, this kind of, this very sad, solemn, slow thing, and we turned this corner kind of on the, on the final approach to this, uh, to this wall. And all of a sudden, the brass just opened up. It was just triumphant. It was, it was the sound of Caesar entering Rome. And at that moment, the sun came out. And it just blew all of the crud off me. You know, the crud, all of the arrogance, all of the, 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 the ignorance, all of the, 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 the sort of passé cynicism just blew it off. It was like a fire essay. And I was a different person after that. And after that ceremony was over, as I was getting back towards the van, I realized something really important, and that is just how exceptional this country is. You have to understand, this is 13 months after the actual attacks now, October 2002. And already, 
the act of blaming ourselves for this was well in motion. It's all our fault. It's always our fault. Well, we did this. We shouldn't have done that. We're over there for oil, 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 all of it, all of it. And I looked at those gravestones out there and I said, nobody, nobody treats their, 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 their soldiers like this. They're dead like this. My dad was not a hero. He'd be the first person to tell you that. Never got shot at, wasn't a combat soldier. He just signed up on the dotted line. He went to Germany, got there in 1945 as a second lieutenant. But on the back of his graduation class, he said, and all of his friends said, what do you expect to be doing in, in 10 years? My dad and most of them wrote, I expect to be killed fighting for my country in Germany. So they're worthy of that kind of respect. In any event, I thought this is a good country. And I was getting back into the van. The person who ran the event, the chaplain, Major Crisp, I remember. I was new to Washington. I'd been there once before to Arlington. And as I looked down the, the, the broad uh, field, which, if you don't know, used to belong to Robert E. Lee and is a measure of contempt for him siding with the Confederacy, the Union decided to bury Union dead in his backyard. I looked down and saw this kind of ugly gray-green wall, and I said to the major, I said, is that the Pentagon? He said, yeah. He said, not only is that the Pentagon, that's the side of the Pentagon that got hit. I said, were you here? Did you, did you see it? He said, I was standing on that hill over there. Can you tell me what this was like? I said, well, we heard this noise. We'd gotten an alert that something was going on. We heard this noise, and we were all convinced it was an incoming missile attack, because we never heard a sound like that before. This really, really super loud, screeching loud sound, getting louder and louder and louder. And all of a sudden, there's this flash of silver and white over our heads, and we look up, and we watch this aircraft just go sailing right into that building. He said, I don't remember the sound. It must have been deafening, but I have no memory of it. He says, I do have a memory of this incredible flash of heat on my face. I remember really thinking, my God, I'm going to burn from the, just from the, the flare. He said, and then it started to rain. I said, rain? He said, yeah. Little pieces of aluminum, little pieces of people falling from the sky. And he said, so we gathered up all these things and we buried them down there. You can see the little monument that we put there. And I'd mentioned a moment ago how we were already well on our way to blaming ourselves for this. And I said to him, do you know that right now in France, one of the best-selling books is by an author who says that this whole thing was an inside job done by the U.S. military, the U.S. government. And Major Crisp said, I'd like to have a talk with him. And I said, yeah, I would too. So I wrote about the experience, sent it to Stephen Den Best, who I was a huge reader of at uh, USS Clueless. He published it on the front page, got an enormous amount of, uh, of attention. And Rachel Lucas, who I still absolutely adore and miss very much, had a very popular blog then. And she basically said, I'll set you up a blog. You should be writing. So I did. So I started writing Eject, Eject, Eject. And the next thing you know, years go by. I write a book called Silent America. I write a bunch of essays about what a great country this is. And then in 2008, PGTV gets started. They hire me originally as an editor. I'm sitting there in the editing room with a bunch of other editors. And I remember somebody came in and said, uh, the on-air talent isn't here. He's in traffic. They were doing shows live then. Can any of you read a teleprompter? I, I, can, I can read a teleprompter. I was a theater major. So they put me in there, and because I was a theater major, I was used to thinking fast on my feet. These were the very, very early days of PJTV and all kinds of technical problems, and people would say, okay, I'd hear in the little earpiece, okay, now we're going to go to uh, uh, John down, at the, uh, down on the ground at the uh, Republican National Committee. John, and uh, the, we don't have the footage. But you know what? Before we get to John, let's talk a little bit about what's actually going on. So just like, think on my feet. Next thing you know, they said, would you like to do one of your essays on the air? I said, sure. I don't know who we can get to present them, because the idea of me reading these things and performing them was utterly ridiculous. I'm serious as I can be. But that led to the atomic bomb video and then all the rest and all the afterburners and went off on my own. That led to the firewalls and all the rest of it. And here you are. Here we are, 20 years later. That's what happened to me. I was a big defender of the Iraq war and a big defender of the action in Afghanistan. I was defenders of them when they were a year or two old, uh, not when they were 20 years old. But one point that I never gave up on and that I think needs to be mentioned today, 
was that the reason that we thought these attacks would continue was because al-Qaeda was all over the world, had the free run of Afghanistan. Bin Laden had disappeared. Their network was everywhere. And they had enormous numbers of recruits after their successful attack of 9-11. And I thought, we're going to start seeing this on a daily basis here. And we didn't. And I maintain to this day, and I continue to maintain it because this is what the evidence tells me, that the reason that we did not see continuing terror attacks, why there has not been, as I write this and as I record this on the 9th of September, the reason that there has not been a terrorist attack of any size on this country in 20 years is because all of the members of al-Qaeda who were going to come over here and commit those atrocities are buried dead in the sands of Afghanistan and Iraq as a result of the United States military. Nobody knows exactly how many, but estimates are pretty good that it's around 40,000 maybe in Iraq and maybe half that much or perhaps a little more in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda disappeared because we went and smashed them in the face. You can talk about all you want to about all of the mistakes that happened during that action and after the action and, and staying there and all of that. That's all up for discussion. That's fine. But what I simply cannot allow to, to go unnoticed is the fact that we killed 60,000 of them in the course of the five or six years immediately following 9-11. That's why there are no attacks. And that's why this, this idea that you can't retaliate. You see, if you retaliate, then you're just going to make more terrorists. No, it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, the Barbary pirates continued to prey on American uh, shipping and shipping around the world, and we kept paying them to do it. Finally, we got tired of paying them, so we went over there, and we did the same thing. We just kicked their asses. And then they realized that we weren't people to be messed with, and that was the end of the Barbary pirates. So... George Bush has his two terms. Barack Obama has his two terms. All of a sudden, we go from being aware of the fact that Iran is supporting all of these people, making most of these IEDs. Most of the casualties that we took in Iraq are directly attributable to Iranian material, training, all of it. All of these IEDs came from Iran. So Barack Obama decides, no, we're going to be friends with Iran. And the next thing you know, we start seeing a resurgence of this new group called ISIS. And they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger and committing more and more atrocities. And they had the attention of the world. They weren't here yet, but they were on their way. And then Donald Trump became president and on his second day in office dropped the largest non-nuclear uh, bomb in the U.S. inventory. Three years later, ISIS was confined to a small island. And I remember watching us bomb the living hell out of that island. And then everything else happened. I don't know, uh, as I said, I'm writing this before 9-11, 2021. I don't know if there's going to be uh, renewed terror attacks on that date. But I do know that we have given them through incompetence, absolute raw incompetence and arrogance, and mostly, mostly, mostly because of the desire of a vain and stupid man who wanted to have a photo opportunity to make himself look good on this anniversary, we have given the people who launched that attack, or at least supported the people who launched that attack, an arsenal of weapons. And we will be paying the price for this for the next century. I'm utterly convinced of this. Absolutely, we will be paying for this for the next century. Once again, once again, those that cannot learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. You know, just a few of us really read history, and fewer still of those numbers understand history, but history is very clear. And history is clear because human nature doesn't change. We continue to see the same problems again and again. Many of the problems that we see were faced by the Greeks 2,500 years ago. So, some of us remember, most of us forget. Those of us that remember have an idea about what's going to happen next because we can learn from what happened before. If you refuse to see what happened, then you're never going to learn anything. And those people are once again in power, and that is also something that is inevitable. That's just how the wheel turns. So here we are, uh, 20 years without an attack on American soil, uh, major terror attack of any kind. 
I hope that record continues for another 20 years, but after what I just saw, I suspect I'm going to be wrong about that. And of all the things that I've done and been through, all the tens of thousands of shows I've done since that day 20 years ago, tens of thousands, and I didn't count, but somebody else did something like 80 million views of all of that content, all of it. There's not been a day when I didn't wake up and pray to God that I was wrong. 